Introduction Imagine a movie in which a wealthy and powerful society made rich from mass slavery is depicted as a benign but oppressed underdog fighting honourably to defend a traditional way of life which is sacred to the society's elites and in which the slaves never rebel. Imagine a movie in which a kingdom of warriors, with a society built on slave labour, is praised as a nation of freedom-loving liberators for defending their nation from evil foreigners. Imagine a movie marketed as historically accurate, which glorifies slaveholders while attempting to mitigate their actions and depict them as reluctant victims of a system beyond their control. Imagine a movie in which a slave-owning sexual predator is presented as the loving husband of a slave girl. The first of these movies was Gods and Generals, released in 2003, which glorified the southern states of the US, downplayed slavery, and implied the Confederacy were the heroes of the Civil War. The second was 300, released in 2006, which, though it was based on a comic, misrepresented the historic Spartans by depicting their army as fighting for freedom while failing to mention Spartan society was based on slavery. The third was Birth of a Nation, released in 1915, an explicitly racist movie which glorified the Ku Klux Klan to the extent that it encouraged their revival. The fourth was Jefferson in Paris, released in 1995, which grossly misrepresented Jefferson's 14-year-old slave girl Sally Hemings as his loving and willing mistress. All of these movies, from the very time of their release until the present day, have been criticised heavily for their distortions of history, whitewashing of slavery, and promotion of racism. There were public campaigns to boycott both Birth of a Nation and 300 as soon as they were released. Historians have condemned all of these movies as historical revisionism and distortion serving racist and white supremacist agendas. In fact, 300 was called both racist and fascist. Both mainstream media and professional movie critics have repeatedly attacked all these movies for historical distortion, glorification of slave owners, racial stereotypes, and for mitigating, whitewashing, or simply ignoring slavery. And this isn't even a fraction of the world-famous, big-budget, high-earning Hollywood movies which have been criticised widely for historical inaccuracy, political bias, and racist agendas. We haven't even started on Braveheart, widely called the least historically accurate movie ever made, Dances with Wolves, condemned for white saviorism, both The Last Samurai and Last of the Mohicans, condemned for noble savage and white saviorism, as well as historical inaccuracy. The list just goes on and on. But now, let's talk about The Woman King. The movie opens with this narration, quote, The African kingdom of Dahomey is at a crossroads. A new king, Gezo, has just taken power. Their enemy, the Oyo Empire, has joined forces with the Mahi people to raid Dahomey villages and sell their captives to European slavers, an evil trade that has pulled both nations into a vicious circle. The powerful Oyo have new guns and horses, but the young king has his own fearsome weapon, an elite force of female soldiers, the Agoji, led by a general, Naniska. Now, these warriors are all that stand between the Oyo and Dahomey's annihilation. End quote. This is the narrative which the entire movie seeks to support. However, despite the movie's marketing insisting on its historical accuracy, despite the movie's writers, director and producers making statements such as, quote, we didn't want to shy away from the truth, end quote, that they, quote, worked really hard to ground it in what we felt would be the reality of this history, end quote, and saying they consulted historians to ensure the movie's accuracy, this very narrative which opens the movie is wildly inaccurate. The entire movie commits the very same kind of whitewashing and historical revisionism as previous movies such as Gods and Generals and Birth of a Nation. This video demonstrates how The Woman King falsifies the history of Dahomey's involvement in the slave trade, covering these topics. 1. Europeans abolished slavery before Dahomey. 2. Dahomey's Minon, the Amazons, were enthusiastic slave raiders. 3. Dahomey's King Gezo opposed the abolition of slavery. 4. Dahomey used slaves to produce palm oil. 5. The Woman King's director responds. Use the timestamps in the video description to navigate the content. Note that during this video, I will be referring to Dahomey's so-called Amazons as Minon, their original name in the Fon language. My pronunciation of Dahomey follows the French pronunciation rather than 
Dahomey, since it is a word which was invented by the French. Europeans abolished slavery before Dahomey. Historically, the events of the movie are taking place no later than 1823, the year of the Dahomey Rebellion against the Oyo Empire. Although the movie depicts Europeans as enthusiastic slave traders and some of Dahomey's elites as opponents of slavery, in reality, the facts were the other way around. The British had already outlawed the Atlantic slave train in 1807 and created the West Africa Squadron, a collection Africa Squadron, a collection to enforce the ban in Africa. However, slavery in the British colonies was not abolished until 1833. In 1819, the US Navy also made some admittedly weak efforts to prevent the transatlantic slave trade. In contrast, Dahomey was doing nothing but supporting the slave trade as much as possible and actively opposing European attempts at abolition. In 1815, Portugal agreed to stop all slave trading north of the equator, though it continued to ship slaves from West Africa to Brazil, and France abolished the slave trade in 1815, though it didn't outlaw slavery in its colonies until 1848. Spain agreed to cease slave trading north of the equator in 1818 and south of the equator by 1820, and in 1826, Brazil agreed to stop slave trading north of the equator. These anti-slavery efforts of the European powers were very slow in coming, very slow to implement, and very imperfectly enforced. However, they were considerably more of an effort at the abolition of slavery than anything Dahomey had ever done in its entire history. In 1823, when the movie's conversation between Gezo and his advisors took place, Dahomey was still an enthusiastic participant in the slave trade, the Minon were conducting slave raids, and Gezo was strongly opposed to ending the slave trade. European nations, on the other hand, had already started abolishing slavery years before. Yet the conversation between Gezo and his advisors makes the Dahomey look like the enlightened abolitionists and the Europeans the backwards and barbarous defenders of slavery. This is a reversal of the facts and a deliberate whitewashing of history. Naniska says, quote, The white man has brought immorality here. They will not stop until the whole of Africa is theirs to enslave. End quote. This is sheer anachronism. Firstly, it explicitly places the blame for slavery entirely on Europeans, representing slavery as an external evil brought to Africa by white men. In turn, this implies slavery was not practiced in Africa prior to European contact which is completely untrue. Secondly, it represents Daniska as having a conception of the whole of Africa, which would have been completely alien to her. Thirdly, it represents her as believing that the Europeans aimed to enslave all of Africa, which they never intended to do, and in fact never tried to do. At the end of the movie, Gezo says, quote, The Europeans and the Americans have seen if you want to hold a people in chains, one must first convince them they are meant to be bound. We joined them in becoming our own oppressors, but no more. No more. We are a warrior people, and there is power in our mind, in our unity, in our culture. If we understand that power, we will be limitless. My people, this is the vision I will lead. It is a vision that we share. End quote. This is all totally anachronistic. Gezo went on to pursue the slave trade for decades until forced to stop by the French. Dahomey's Minon were enthusiastic slave raiders. To its credit, the movie does show Dahomey involved in the slave trade. At 12 minutes and 15 seconds and 12 minutes 29 to 30 seconds, we see slaves with their hands tied and heads bowed being kept in the part of the palace where the Minon are training. At 12 minutes 47 to 51 seconds, Nawi is told, quote, Some of the men who raided our village, the rest will be sold in Ouida, end quote. The port of Ouida was a major hub for the slave trade, and Dahomey is estimated to have sold at least one million slaves through this port over a couple of centuries. However, in this scene, the only people identified as slaves are bad people, described as, quote, men who raided our village, end quote. There is no mention of the fact that the Dahomey Minon, or Amazons, were used by Dahomey as slave raiders to capture men, women, and children from Dahomey's neighbours to use as slaves for Dahomey's domestic slave market, or sell them as slaves to Europeans, or use them as human sacrifices in Dahomey's annual ritual in honour of the king, in which slaves, criminals, and captives of war were beheaded to celebrate Dahomey's monarch. Later, Gezo is discussing politics with his advisers. At 16 minutes 32 seconds, one of his advisers notes, quote, 
Dahomey has prospered in the peace, end quote. To which Daniska replies, quote, The slave trade is the reason we prosper, but at what price? It is a poison slowly killing us, and the Europeans know this. They come to our land for their human cargo, end quote. This is historical revisionism, placing modern sentiments in the mouth of a historical figure. There is no evidence anyone in Dahomey was thinking this way at the time that the movie's events are set, around 1823. It is true that the slave trade was the reason why Dahomey prospered, but there is no indication that Gezo or any of his advisers thought that this was a bad thing, certainly not a poison killing the nation. Note also how Naniska calls the slaves, quote, their human cargo, end quote, as if the Europeans are responsible for the African slave trade. She doesn't say, they come to our land for the humans we have enslaved and turned into cargo to sell so we can profit from them. Another advisor interjects, quote, they've come to trade, we sell them what they want, end quote. Naniska responds, quote, but why do we sell our captives? For weapons? To capture more people? To sell for more weapons? End quote. Well, yes, that's exactly what Dahomey were actually doing. However, Izogi, one of the Minon, agrees with Daniska, saying, quote, It is a dark circle with no end. This is not the way. End quote. Again, this is just wishful thinking, making historical people say things which are acceptable to a modern audience and attempting to present the Minon as opponents of the slave trade. In reality, they were not only slave raiders, they were enthusiastic supporters of the slave trade and regularly urged Gezo to continue it. When Naniska asks, quote, why do we sell our captives, end quote, it sounds like the Dahomey are just selling their prisoners of war, whereas in fact many of their captives were not prisoners of war, but civilians caught by the Dahomey specifically to sell as slaves. As to why they sold them, it was to make money, buy guns, and expand the Dahomey empire even further. Other slaves were captured by the Dahomey to use as sources of agricultural labour, a point which will become particularly important when we look at what the movie has to say about Dahomey's involvement in the palm oil trade. Notably, the movie never provides the slaves of the Dahomey with a voice or any agency. We are never permitted to hear their perspective, see them opposing their own slavery, or see them resisting or escaping. They are silenced and stripped of agency. King Gezo opposed the abolition of slavery. At 43 minutes and 2 seconds, the villain Santo Ferreira is introduced. He is represented as a Portuguese slave trader who helped King Gezo seize the throne in a coup. This villain is based on the real-life historical figure of Francisco Félix de Souza, a Brazilian slave trader who was extremely influential in West Africa, who certainly did enable Gezo's ascension to the throne through a coup, and who was his reliable ally and major slave trading partner. In the movie, Ferreira uses a port in Ouida as his base. This is Forte de São João Baptista de Ajuda, originally built by the Portuguese to support their slave trade. However, by the time of the movie, it was no longer occupied by the Portuguese due to European anti-slavery efforts. It was an abandoned shell in 1823 when this movie is set. Although Jesusa, the historical figure on whom the movie's character Ferreira is based, did take possession of it in the 1820s, he did not use it as a base for his own slavery operations, and it remained abandoned. Around this time in the movie, Naniska says to Gezo, quote, Let's not be an empire that sells its people. Let us be an empire who loves its people, end quote. Gezo says, quote, My brothers sold our own. I will never do that, end quote. Naniska replies, quote, Even if they are not Dahomey, they are still our people, end quote. There are a couple of problems here. The first is that Gezo certainly did sell his own. In fact, by this very stage of the movie, he had already done it. Historian Ana Lucia Araujo explains that when Gezo's coup succeeded and he seized the throne in 1818, quote, he punished his half-brother's family members by selling them into slavery outside the kingdom's borders, end quote. Not only that, but Araujo also says that by 1825, Gezo had become unpopular among his own people, quote, for selling Dahomeyan subjects, end quote. So he literally was selling some of his very own people, Dahomey citizens, into slavery. The other problem is that Naniska's statement that even African people who are not Dahomey are, quote, still our people, end quote, is anachronistic pan-Africanism. During this time, there was no sense of a unified African people with a shared identity. There were hundreds of different ethnic groups, 
each with their own distinct identity, language, and culture, who not only differentiated themselves from each other, but did not see each other as united by any single shared identity. They did not think of themselves or others as Africans, and they certainly did not see themselves as sharing any kind of kinship, either literal or figurative. On this point, Kenyan historian Ali al-Amin Mazri wrote, somewhat controversially, quote, It remains one of the great ironies of modern African history that it took European colonialism to remind Africans that they were Africans, end quote. Later in the movie, Gezo speaks with Santo Ferreira, who comments, quote, So you wish to sell palm oil? End quote. Gezo replies, quote, I wish for my people to prosper as those of your land do. End quote. Ferreira says, quote, Gezo, the people in my lands prosper because of the slave trade, and this very same trade has made you rich, as rich as the King of England. If you stop the trade, you will be nothing. End quote. He adds that the slave traders will, quote, take their business elsewhere. End quote. To which Gezo replies, quote, the business of selling Africans, end quote. Again, there are a couple of problems here. Firstly, this is more anachronistic pan-Africanism. In reality, Gezo did not think of people as Africans. Note also the careful framing of the business of selling Africans as something Europeans do, not something that African kingdoms do. This is particularly ironic given that Dahomey itself was in the business of selling slaves. Secondly, if Ferreira is supposed to be Portuguese, it is very odd that he is referring to his people enjoying the wealth of the slave trade and does not mention Portugal had already outlawed slave trading above the equator. This is further evidence that Ferreira is based on Jesusa, the Brazilian, since Brazil at this time had yet to outlaw the slave trade in any region. The movie consistently represents Ferreira as the powerful and predatory European slave trader and Gezo as the weak and submissive local ruler who is reluctantly compelled to participate in a trade from which he cannot escape. In reality, Gezo held all the power and participated in the slave trade deliberately because it made him very wealthy and powerful. Since an anti-slave trade party did emerge within Dahomey in the middle of the 19th century, supported by a group of wealthy merchants who had invested heavily in the palm oil trade, historian Ana Araujo says... Quote, historians have perceived Gezo's reign as a period of transition from the illegal slave trade to the legitimate trade of palm oil, end quote. However, she disputes this, observing, quote, in the early years of his reign, Gezo continued to contend that the slave trade was a central part of the kingdom's revenue, end quote. In fact, Araujo observes, under Gezo, the total number of slaves sold from his port at Ouida was even larger than under the previous king of Dahomey, and, quote, the annual averages of slave exports were very similar, end quote. One of Gezo's most infamous statements, made in 1849, not only declared his unwavering determination to maintain the slave trade, but also insisted that it was essential to his people's culture and economy. The statement, part of which has been much quoted since the release of The Woman King, reveals just how dedicated Gezo was to preserving slavery. Gezo said, quote, I and my army are ready at all times to fight the Queen's enemies and do anything the English government may ask of me except to give up the slave trade. No other trade is known to my people, end quote. He also explicitly rejected palm oil and other forms of income as substitutes, stating, quote, palm oil, it is true, is engaging the attention of some of them, but it is a slow method of making money and brings only a very small amount of duties into my coffers. The planting of cotton and coffee has been suggested, but that is slower still, end quote. Gezo insisted on slavery as a perfectly respectable tradition of his people, explaining, quote, The slave trade has been the ruling principle of my people. It is the source of their glory and wealth. Their songs celebrate their victories, and the mother lulls the child to sleep with notes of triumph over an enemy reduced to slavery, end quote. It would be anachronistic to place this actual statement in the movie, given that Gezo didn't make it until around 25 years after the date of the movie's events. However, it is misleading at best, and dishonest at worst, for the movie to represent Gezo as merely a reluctant participant in the slave trade, only selling slaves because a Portuguese trader told him to. The fact that Gezo is portrayed consistently as a fearful pawn of European powers is completely inaccurate. In reality, Gezo felt absolutely no concern about completely rejecting the requests of even the British government, despite their anti-slavery naval blockade. 
Gazo's depiction in the movie is symptomatic of one of its key problems. In this movie, Dahomeans only do bad things because other people force them to. Gazo only sells slaves because a Portuguese trader tells him he has to. And Dahomey's warriors only capture slaves because the Oyo Empire requires them to. Not only is this historically inaccurate, it's a deliberate attempt to absolve them of responsibility for their actions. It is also completely undermined later when Gezo and his people decide to just stop doing what other people tell them to, which they could have simply done in the first place. Dahomey used slaves to produce palm oil. At 17 minutes 11 seconds, Daniska says, quote, We have other things to sell, corn, palm oil, we can double our harvest, end quote. Adding, quote, I want Dahomey to survive, end quote. Gezo agrees reluctantly to pay the tribute to the oil empire, promising it will be the last time, and comments, quote, As for the palm oil, Naniska, show me, show me how much you can produce, and we will see, end quote. Again, this is historical fabrication. At this time in Dahomey's history, there was no domestic push to abolish the slave trade and replace it with palm oil sales. In fact, as we will see later, it wasn't until around 20 years later that the British pressured a reluctant King Gezo to stop selling slaves and start selling palm oil instead. We will also learn more about another unfortunate fact the movie doesn't reveal. Dahomey's domestic palm oil industry also used slavery. At 15 minutes and 40 seconds, workers are seen farming palms for palm oil. Naniska says, quote, This field alone produces thousands of barrels of palm oil. If we harvest many fields each year, we will have a continuous supply to trade, end quote. Gezo replies, quote, I never saw a path before, Naniska, but look at this, now I do, end quote. Naniska responds, quote, Vision is seeing what others do not, end quote. As mentioned previously, this is completely inaccurate. Neither Gezo nor his advisors were attempting to transition from selling slaves to selling palm oil at this point in time. Dahomey didn't even start producing palm oil in export quantities until the 1840s, and only then as a result of intense pressure by the British, who were trying to persuade Gezo to end his involvement in the slave trade. But there's more. When advocates for palm oil did emerge in Dahomey, Gezo was not one of them. In fact, he directly opposed a shift in economy from slavery to palm oil. In 1848, he wrote a letter to Queen Victoria explicitly requesting that he be permitted to maintain his monopoly on the West African slave trade and even asking the Queen to prevent European traders visiting the ports of his rivals, explaining he was concerned their trade was making them wealthy and enabling them to resist his authority. Not only that, he actively tried to suppress the palm oil trade of his neighbours. In this same letter, he requested the British remove all palm oil factories from neighbouring regions so that instead merchants would buy products from his own port at Weida, including, of course, slaves, explaining directly that this would increase his tax revenue. He also asked Queen Victoria to, quote, send him some good tower guns and blunderbusses and plenty of them, end quote, so that he could make war on his neighbours. In his 2020 article, The Bite of Benin, Dahomey and the Dominance of Export Slavery, Angus Dalrymple-Smith explains that Gezo actively rejected switching to the palm oil trade, writing, quote, The state instead focused its efforts on military campaigns and reviving the slave trade, end quote. He adds, quote, During the 1820s, the king, Gezo, took advantage of the collapse of the Oyo Empire to increase the extent and frequency of military expeditions to capture slaves and extend the kingdom's power. End quote. By the 1830s, British efforts to shut down the slave trade were starting to interfere with Dahomey's profits. In response, Dalrymple Smith notes, quote, The Dahomeyans responded by developing more elaborate strategies to avoid the British blockade. End quote. Gezo was determined to preserve his kingdom's main source of power and revenue, regardless of efforts to stop him. During the 1840s, Gezo went so far as to send Queen Victoria a letter explaining that it was impossible for him to end the slave trade and replace it with the palm oil industry. Firstly, he said, because it was in conflict with his people's culture, and secondly, he said, because he would lose money. He wrote, quote, At present, my people are a warlike people and unaccustomed to agricultural pursuits. I should not be enabled to keep up my revenue were I at once to stop the slave trade, end quote. Gezo's claim that he could not create a palm oil industry to replace the slave trade because his people were, quote, unaccustomed to agricultural pursuits, end quote, was very obviously a complete fabrication and an empty excuse 
to defend his perpetuation of the slave trade. In case there is any doubt about this, it is demonstrated indisputably by the fact that Gezo eventually realized he could earn money from both the slave trade and the palm oil trade at the same time. In his 1980 article, Dahomey Economic Policy Under Gezo, 1818-1858, E.A. Sumoni writes, quote, Thus, to encourage palm oil production held a double advantage for Gezo, especially if this could be carried on hand-in-hand hand with slave trading. The new product would simply mean an increase in revenue, end quote. Consequently, Somoni explains, Gezo made a law requiring all palm oil plantations to pay him a special tax in the form of a percentage of the oil they produced, and also, quote, declared the palm a sacred tree which it was forbidden to cut down, end quote. This particularly shrewd act of ecological conservation ensured the tree would be preserved for economic exploitation. Now we must return to another awkward fact about Dahomey's palm plantations. Despite the movie's heavy emphasis on Dahomey's development of the palm oil industry as a replacement for the slave trade, it completely omits to mention the fact that Dahomey's plantations used slaves. Not only that, but Gezo permitted the Brazilian slave trader Gessouza to operate his own palm oil plantations using slave labour. Firstly, Gezo made money from Jesusa by selling him the slaves. Then he made more money from Jesusa by taking a percentage of the oil from Jesusa's plantations and selling it to increase the royal income. As Dalrymple Smith writes, quote, It therefore became possible to both export sufficient numbers of slaves whilst at the same time retaining more for the production of export crops, end quote. Gezo was effectively profiting from the slave trade twice over, Firstly, by continuing to sell slaves, and secondly, by taxing palm oil plantations which used slave labour. This particular stroke of economic genius is never mentioned in The Woman King. As if that wasn't enough, in 1841, Gezo also permitted the French Regis Company to continue its clandestine involvement in the slave trade and set up its own palm oil plantations using slaves. Gezo earned large sums of money by taxing the palm oil production of Gisolza and the Regis company, so he was literally profiting from their exploitation of the slaves they purchased from Dahomey and other enslavers. However, Gezo didn't stop there. Not content with earning money from the foreign slave traders by selling them slaves to work in their plantations and then taking a cut of their palm oil production, he also set up his own plantations, which of course also used slave labour. This led to an even greater use of slaves in Dahomey than ever before. Somoni writes that the loss of Dahomey's access to the broader slave trade, especially the American slave market, quote, made for a more widespread exploitation of slave labour in the king's own palm plantations and in those of other royal dignitaries, end quote. He attributes this directly to Gezo's actions, writing, quote, the big palm oil boom in Dahomey was subsequent to the setting up of the Regis factory in which enterprise both Gezo and Jesusa played decisive roles, end quote. Historian Patrick Manning explains that as a result of Gezo's desire to earn money from palm oil as well as slavery, quote, the slave labour sector also expanded to meet the demand for palm products, probably at a greater rate than the commodity exchange sector, end quote. He explains how the Dahomey monarchy, warlords, officials and merchants all became involved in establishing plantations, not only in Dahomey's territory, but also, quote, around the major Yoruba cities, end quote. These plantations often used Yoruba people as slaves. Having defeated the Yoruba empire and freed themselves from its system of tribute, Dahomey promptly turned around and enslaved the Yoruba. Although Dahomey's palm oil plantations did use enslaved Dahomey people themselves, Dalrymple Smith writes, quote, foreign slaves were usually preferred as their labour could be more intensively exploited than slaves who shared a common cultural linguistic heritage with their masters, end quote. He adds, quote, male Yoruba slaves were among the first to be used to increase palm oil production, despite their unwillingness to be involved in what was considered female work, end quote. He also explains that although this practice began in the 1840s, it was not widespread until the following decade. Naturally, the Yoruba did not appreciate being enslaved in this way, and in 1855, there was a Yoruba slave revolt in the Dahomey city of Abhome. However, it was quickly suppressed. Manning writes that this revolt, quote, provides an indication of the scale of slavery and the severity of exploitation at that time, end quote. <laughs> 
The historical facts completely contradict the woman king's narrative. Gezo was never convinced to replace slavery with palm oil production since, as Dalrymple Smith writes, quote, for the Dahomeyan monarchy and its elite supporters, palm oil was far less profitable than slave trading, end quote. Even though the production of palm oil used slaves, the process of producing and transporting the oil was labour and time intensive, making it much more lucrative and time efficient to simply sell the slaves in the first place. Consequently, Dalrymple Smith observes, quote, from the 17th to the middle of the 19th century, it was never in the interests of the elites to stimulate a non-slave export trade, end quote. Again, this completely contradicts the woman king's presentation of Gezo as a reluctant participant in the slave trade who was searching for an alternative source of revenue to replace it. Dalrymple Smith further writes that Dahomey's dedication to the slave trade, quote, was strengthened by the development of an elite ideology that glorified war and opposed any other trade except in slaves, end quote, adding that, quote, this was strong enough to survive into the 19th century in spite of the general decline of the transatlantic slave trade, end quote. This arrangement of effectively profiting twice over from the slave trade, firstly by selling slaves and secondly by using slave labour to produce palm oil, was so lucrative that many of Dahomey's elites continued to resist ending slavery even as the transatlantic slave trade was dying out. Not only that, but after Gezo's death, according to Dalrymple Smith, Galele, the next king of Dahomey, quote, attempted to reorient the state back towards a slave trading model, end quote. So, far from the palm oil industry being the method by which Gezo ended and replaced the slave trade, as the woman king represents, instead it was a method by which Gezo added to his already lucrative income from the slave trade by exploiting not only his own palm oil slave labourers, but the slave labourers on the plantations of domestic and foreign palm oil producers. Once more, we find the actual historical facts are radically different from the way they are presented in The Woman King. The Woman King's director responds. On the 28th of September 2022, director Gina Prince Blythewood responded to criticism of The Woman King in a Los Angeles Times article entitled The Truth Behind The Woman King, Crew Responds to Claims of Historical Revisionism. From the start, Prince Blythewood declared, quote, I don't think you should ever fabricate the truth, end quote. In this regard, it is clear that she failed, since her movie does fabricate the truth in a wide range of ways, as I have already demonstrated. The article claims, quote, The director did a deep dive into research about Dahomey and the Agoji, end quote citing her collaboration with, quote, historical consultant Leonard Wanchikon, who is directly related to a member of the Agoji, end quote. The article also says Prince Blythewood, quote, found that much of the information written about the kingdom was from the perspective of European colonizers, end quote. This is a convenient statement which implies a great deal without actually proving anything. Firstly, it implies there's not a lot of reliable historical information on Dahomey and the Minon, which is not true, and that such information is hard to find, which is also untrue. Secondly, it implies that information written by European sources contemporary with Dahomey are necessarily biased and inaccurate. This isn't true either. In fact, it's ironic that the visual and textual descriptions of Dahomey and the Minon by 19th century European commentators who visited the country are more accurate than those in The Woman King. For example, the costumes the Minon wear into battle are fictional and look a lot more like the costumes fabricated for the Minon who toured Europe in late 19th century ethnic shows. We're going to see a lot of this in the director's response. Unsubstantiated claims which are phrased in such a way as to imply their factual accuracy while discouraging critical scrutiny or requests for details. Terms such as colonizer are used here as buzzwords to simply delegitimize scholarly works which are actually both accurate and reliable. This is not only intellectually dishonest, it's actively deceptive. This is even more ironic given that Prince Blythewood claimed that the movie's production designer, quote, started combing through and excising anything from the colonizer's point of view, end quote, adding, quote, he knew which photos were fake and created for the world fair. There are so few actual photos of these women. Most of them are recreated, end quote. 
The production designer clearly did a very bad job since the Minon in The Woman King are never seen in the clothing depicted clearly in 19th century photos and illustration of the Minon in Dahomey itself, nor do they use the same weapons. The movie depicts the Minon in clothing which is very similar to the photos taken at the World Fair and other exotified exhibitions of the Minon in Europe, complete with the cowrie shell decorations which the real Minon did not wear into battle. In the LA Times article, Prince Blythewood continues to claim sources on the Minon are meagre and typically inaccurate, stating, quote, When you look up Dahomey and the Agoji, you'll see there's only one book on it, and it's a book that's offensive, end quote. This simply isn't true. The book she's referring to has also been cited by Viola Davis, who likewise misrepresents it completely. The book is Amazons of Black Sparta, The Women Warriors of Dahomey, by Stanley B. Alpern and it's considered one of the best books on the subject. It uses an extremely wide range of primary sources, including many texts from Dahomey itself, from laws and diplomatic communications, to translations of the songs by the Minon themselves. It's also by no means the only scholarly book on the topic. There are also others, as well as a wide range of scholarly articles, including quite a few written by academics from African countries. The idea that the book is offensive was also promoted by Viola Davis, who cited the book by name, stating, quote, There is one book, The Amazons of the Black Sparta, written by a white man, end quote. Note again the carefully chosen words, written by a white man, intended to imply that it must necessarily be both historically inaccurate and offensive, since it's apparently not possible for a white man to write accurately and inoffensively about African history. This is a fallacy called poisoning the well, attempting to discredit a source before you say more about it, and hopefully before your target audience has any opportunity to learn about the source independently. It's just a dishonest rhetorical trick. Ironically, the LA Times article makes no mention of the other reason why researching Dahomey's history can be difficult. Dahomey's own elites have regularly altered and fabricated records of the kingdom's past. Sometimes, when a king was overthrown by a coup, records of his reign were destroyed and new accounts were written and popularised, describing him as evil in order to justify the coup and validate the reign of the new king. In fact, King Gezo did exactly this to the previous king, Arendozan, whom he overthrew in a military coup. Gezo composed and promoted a revisionist history describing Arendozan as a savage monarch whose wicked reign needed to be ended by force. Historian Robin Law comments that it has only been recently that this false account has been challenged, citing the work of the highly respected Nigerian historian and professor emeritus Isaac Adiagbo Akinjogan, who describes it as, quote, totally misleading, end quote, and a method of justifying Gezo's takeover of the throne. Law also explains that Adan Dozen's name was removed from the official list of Dahomey's kings, showing again how Dahomey's own elites deliberately falsified and fabricated their own history for their political ends. So it's intellectually dishonest to insinuate that a history of Dahomey written by a white man will necessarily be inaccurate. It's also negligent not to mention that histories of Dahomey written by Dahomey's elites themselves have frequently been much edited and falsified. Though to be fair, Davis may simply be completely unaware of this fact. Davis makes further claims about Alpern's book, saying, quote, I had to cross out a lot of it because it was full of editorial comments like, they looked like beasts, they were ugly, they were mannish. You had to sift through all of that, end quote. I own a copy of this book, so I can say with confidence that Davis is completely wrong. Firstly, the book never refers to the Minon as beasts at all. Secondly, there is only one instance of the word ugly being applied to the appearance of the Minon. It isn't an editorial comment by the author. It's a quotation from a 19th century French writer who saw some of the Minon when they visited France, and he wasn't calling them ugly. On the contrary, he stated explicitly that they were, quote, neither fierce, nor sinister, nor even ugly, end quote. So the book literally says the opposite of what Davis claimed. Thirdly, the book never refers to the Minon as mannish. However, it does quote statements and songs from the Minon themselves, who declared proudly that as a result of their military training, they had transformed themselves from women to men. 
One of the Minon officers is quoted stating, quote, As the blacksmith takes an iron bar and by fire changes its fashion, so we have changed our nature. We are no longer women, we are men. End quote. Two of the Minon's own songs are also quoted, one stating, quote, We are men, not women, end quote, and the other declaring, quote, Let us march boldly like men. End quote. So once again, Davis is completely misrepresenting the book, which contains the exact opposite of what she claims. The fact that Davis manages to make three statements about the book which are so wildly untrue suggests that she has never read it herself and is merely reciting what she has heard about it. That's the most charitable interpretation. The article also quoted historical consultant Professor Leonard Wanchikon attempting to defend the Woman King's historical narrative, stating, quote, In the mid-19th century, there was a very robust opposition to continue in the slave trade, end quote. This is rather ambiguously phrased. On the surface, it looks like it's saying that in the mid-19th century, there was robust opposition to the slave trade in the Kingdom of Dahomey, but it doesn't quite say that. It hints at it very strongly, without actually making the claim directly. Of course, during that time, there was robust opposition to the slave trade, both in Europe and in Africa, but not in Dahomey. Consequently, this is very misleading phrasing. He continues by saying, quote, Europeans tend to write a lot on how the British government tried to stop the trade, but not enough on the opposition and the movement from within Africa, end quote. This is another statement which is made without any evidence or citations. Who are these Europeans? We're not told. We're just expected to believe that this is what Europeans do. Imagine making a similar statement about what Africans do. Imagine saying something like, Africans were enthusiastic participants in the transatlantic slave trade, as though this was the standard practice from North Africa to the Southern Cape, collapsing hundreds of different ethnic groups under the single label African and attributing the same behaviour to all of them. In reality, there are many academic journal articles and entire book treatments on the subject of how the slave trade was resisted from within Africa itself. This comment is just a distraction from the real issue, which is the woman king's historical revisionism. It certainly doesn't change the fact, which Wanjikon never acknowledges here, that the Kingdom of Dahomey didn't give up slavery until it was literally forced to by decades of pressure from the British and French. Avoiding this just makes Wanchikon look deliberately misleading. Although he only hinted at it previously, Wanchikon then attempts to argue that there really was an anti-slavery movement within the Kingdom of Dahomey during Gezo's reign, writing, quote, If you take the Ogoji, for example, many of them were former captives. So when they rose into positions of power, they would push the government and king away from the slave trade. Adam Dozen is known to have expressed opposition, end quote. Notice again the very careful phrasing used. He says that many of the Minon were former captives and suggests that, quote, when they rose to power, they would push the government and the king away, end quote, from slavery. When we read this closely, we see that once more what we have here is not an actual statement of fact. It's actually a suggestion of what he thinks the Minon would have done, given their personal background. It's not actually true that many of the Minon were former captives. Most of them were Dahomey civilians who had never been captives. Additionally, we have clear evidence that during the reign of Gezo, the Minon were enthusiastic supporters of the slave trade. They boasted and sang of their slave raids and the number of captives, and urged Gezo to let them attack a city of refuge to which ex-slaves had fled. This is a matter of historical record, so we're not left with guesswork on the topic. None of this is mentioned by Wanchikon. He then goes on to comment, quote, The king before Gezo, Anand Dozan, is known to have expressed opposition, end quote, to the slave trade. It's worth pointing out that if the producers of the movie really were so interested in showcasing a Dahomey monarch who genuinely combated slavery, they could have just done that, but they didn't. If they thought so well of King Anand Dozan, they could have showcased his life instead of Gezo's, but they didn't. Regardless, the claim that Anand Dozan opposed the slave trade is misleading. It is true that some scholars, including the well-respected Akin Jobin, cited earlier, have argued that Adan Dozen was a reformer who sought to end the slave trade. It's true that Adan Dozen imprisoned Jesusa, the powerful Brazilian slave trader who would later become so successful under King Gezo. 
It is also true that Anandozan dealt very strictly with the European merchants who came to his coastal ports, including expelling Portuguese merchants who were involved in the slave trade or kidnapping them and holding them to ransom for large sums of money. On the basis of data such as this, some scholars have attempted to argue that Anandozan opposed the slave trade and attempted to either end it or at least disentangle Dahomey's economy from it. So when Wanchikon claims Adendozan, quote, is known to have expressed opposition, end quote, he is not simply making things up. This is an argument which has appeared in academic literature. However, these arguments are not currently in favour. They are typically found in literature from 20 to 40 years ago. Historian Finn Fuglestar has described these claims as, quote, based on somewhat flimsy evidence, end quote, and other recent assessments are very critical of them. The reason for this becomes apparent when we examine the historical evidence more closely. Adam Doza never actually tried to stop Jisulza trading in slaves. His imprisonment of Jisulza was not motivated by an opposition to the slave trade, but by a fear that Jisulza was gaining too much power and influence. Similarly, Adendozen's harsh treatment of Portuguese slave merchants was not due to his opposition to their involvement in the slave trade. Araujo explains that it was because Adendozen, quote, demanded the Portuguese to exclusively trade in slaves at Ouida, end quote, Dahomey's main west coast port. By doing so, Adendozen could benefit from the Portuguese slave traders by taxing their exchanges while also depriving his local economic rivals of the Portuguese slave trade revenue. In fact, Adendozan started his reign by attempting to renew Dahomey's slumping slave trade by raiding his neighbours and capturing them until the Oyo Empire became so strong that it was able to curtail Dahomey's slave raiding. This was the era during which Dahomey became a tribute state to the Oyo Empire. Although Adendozan did try to move Dahomey's economy to agriculture, he was not motivated by a desire to end slavery. Instead, he only did this when European efforts to stop the slave trade had reduced its profits so significantly that it was becoming economically unviable. Wanchikon stated directly, quote, No one will deny that Tahome was involved in the slave trade, end quote, but went on to say, But according to recent data, it accounted for roughly 3.5% of the trade, far less than Lagos, Ghana and Angola. So it's important to put that in perspective, end quote. This simply means Dahomey traded fewer slaves than its competitors, but exactly what does this do for our understanding of Dahomey's role in the slave trade? What is being put into perspective here? Is the implication that we shouldn't criticise Dahomey because it didn't trade as many slaves as other nations? Is the implication that Dahomey's involvement in the slave trade isn't very important because it traded fewer slaves than other nations? How about this for a perspective? Over the period of 1514 to 1866, the United States was responsible for only 3.8% of the transatlantic slave trade, almost the same amount as Dahomey. But US involvement in the slave trade is discussed and criticised more than any other nations, either European or African. Does the fact that the US traded barely 10% of the slaves of nations such as Portugal and the UK mitigate the US involvement in the slave trade? I don't think so. Wanchikon continued by arguing, quote, This movie is not about the whole history of Dahomey. It is about a specific time where all the stars were aligned against continuing the slave trade, end quote. This is true, but the problem is the movie doesn't even represent accurately the specific time in Dahomey history which it depicts. Additionally, while the phrase, quote, All the stars were aligned against continuing the slave trade, end quote, is true, Wanchikon is avoiding the fact that the Kingdom of Dahomey, and Gezo in particular, was doing its utmost to perpetuate the slave trade, despite all the stars being aligned against it. Wanchikon adds, quote, And the data from slave exports during that time, the politics and the conflict in place, all showed that this was happening, end quote, which is also true. However, the point is, it wasn't happening in Dahomey. Instead, Dahomey was doing the opposite. It's very simple. Dahomey shouldn't be depicted as a pioneer in opposing the slave trade at this point in time, when in reality it was upholding the slave trade while other people were opposing it. Prince Blythewood makes a similar argument, stating, quote, Where Dahomey was at that time, the crossroads that Gezo was facing, the Oyo versus Dahomey battle, all of that is truthful and real, and what the Agoji were fighting for, end quote. The problem with this is that it's an awkward mix of fact and fiction, 
Firstly, at the time at which the movie is set, Gezo was not facing a crossroads. He was not standing at a junction attempting to choose between slavery and non-slavery. If we're as generous as possible and define this crossroads as the option to abolish slavery, well, that option had been available to Dahomey monarchs for centuries, but they had deliberately chosen to reject it, and Gezo was no different. Secondly, the Oyo versus Dahomey battle is a historical fact, and the Dahomey really did defeat the Oyo as depicted in the movie. Additionally, historically, the Dahomey did indeed fight the Oyo in order to free themselves from tribute, just as the movie shows. However, important elements of the history are missing here. The Oyo attack depicted in the movie was a response to Dahomey's repeated slave raids into Oyo territory, and I find it hard to summon up much sympathy for the Dahomey becoming a tribute state of the Oyo Empire when the Dahomey Empire had done exactly the same to various of its neighbours and then turned around and did exactly the same to the Oyo Empire once it defeated them. When two slave trading empires exchange blows in a struggle for territorial and economic supremacy, bringing misery to hundreds of thousands of people by enslaving them, I don't find either of them inspiring or worthy of sympathy. Thirdly, although it's totally true that the Minon were fighting for the freedom of Dahomey from the Oyo Empire, it's entirely untrue that they were fighting for the abolition of slavery. On the contrary, they were fighting for the preservation of slavery. It's true that The Woman King isn't a documentary, and it shouldn't be held to the same standards of accuracy as a documentary. But as I have said previously, it should be held to the standards of accuracy which its creators have themselves claimed to uphold. The problem is that when it is held to those standards, it fails. The phrase, quote, there's a tremendous amount of truth within this, end quote, is a vague statement attempting to paper over the cracks of the movie's actual distortion of the historical record a distortion which whitewashes the truth of Dahomey's involvement in slavery and the slave trade. In the same article, Dr. Raquel Gates, who teaches film and media studies at Columbia University, is quoted asking, quote, What is the goal of film? Is it to educate? Is it to portray history? Or is it to capture themes and the spirit of issues facing the human condition? End quote. Well, that depends on the film. A film could do any, all, or none of these things. But this particular film was explicitly framed as history, and not only marketed as historically accurate, but presented as extremely historically accurate, with repeated claims made about the extent to which the creators took great care to do the research required to present the history accurately. It was also marketed as significantly more accurate than previous presentations of the same history, even more accurate than certain academic treatments, and as a correction to conventional understandings of this history. The movie's creators made the explicit claim that this movie had been produced to a high standard of historical accuracy, so it's entirely reasonable to hold the movie to the same standard for which the movie's creators aimed and assess it on that basis. Conclusion Gates also expressed frustration with people who object to historical revisionism in The Woman King on the grounds that other movies have done the same thing. In a lengthy statement, Gates explained, quote, I've seen plenty of films that deal with the civil rights movement, slavery, where the filmmaker, the screenwriter, will find that one random white person who was kind of sort of around and design the entire film around them as the hero and the protagonist. Now, is that historically accurate? I guess that white dude was around. Are you translating the spirit of the civil rights movement when you do that? No you're actually doing something incredibly offensive by centering whiteness in a story that is supposed to be about blackness and about black liberation, end quote. This is highly ironic since this is exactly what The Woman King does. It takes Gezo, Naniska and Nawi and centres the movie around them as the heroes and protagonists who save an oppressed people and end the slave trade in their kingdom. Now, is that historically accurate? Well, some of those black people weren't even around. Both Naniska and Nawi were real historical figures who lived at least 50 years after the events of The Woman King took place. At least Gezo was around, so that's something. Is The Woman King translating the spirit of the historical events when they do that? No, it's actually doing something incredibly offensive by centering unrepentant slave traders in a story which should be about the suffering of the people they dehumanised, enslaved, sold and murdered. It's not even necessary to mention all the European efforts to end the slave trade at this time. The European powers don't need to be glorified, praised, or even cited in order to depict the actions of Dahomey accurately. Gates also issued this challenge. Quote, And so my question is, you throw historical inaccuracy out there, like, you back it up. 
What do you think the film is doing that you find offensive? End quote. Well, in other videos, I have already identified verifiable historical inaccuracies in the costumes, the weapons, the combat training, the battle scenes, specific people, dates, and events. However, as I've explained previously, most of these are not actual deal breakers for me. I can accept a certain degree of Hollywood license being taken just to fit the movie into a specific shooting schedule and budget. What's really offensive is the way the movie inaccurately depicts Gezo, the Dahomey Minon, and the Kingdom of Dahomey itself in explicitly heroic terms which completely whitewash their involvement in the slave trade. You want historical inaccuracies which I can back up? You want to know what I find offensive? Here's a list of the historical inaccuracies I find offensive. I've backed up these objections with multiple sources throughout this video. 1. Inaccurately depicting the Kingdom of Dahomey as only trading in slaves out of duress, being forced to do so by the Oyo Empire or European merchants. This diminishes their responsibility for their participation in the slave trade and shifts the blame to other people. 2. Inaccurately depicting King Gezo as only a reluctant participant in the slave trade while seeking a way to get out of it. This falsifies the historical record since he was not only an enthusiastic supporter of the trade but actively resisted anti-slavery campaigns and shut down attempts to replace slavery with an alternative source of revenue. 3. Inaccurately depicting the Dahomey Minon as only taking slaves as prisoners of war after battles with enemy raiders and armies which had attacked Dahomey. This falsifies the historical record since they not only raided enemy villages to capture men, women and children as slaves, they sometimes took some people as slaves from the villages they raided and just murdered the rest, men, women or children. 4. Inaccurately depicting the Dahomey Minon as actively opposed to the slave trade and pioneers of an alternative source of revenue. This falsifies the historical record since the Minon were not only entirely happy with being slave raiders themselves, they also urged King Gezo to let them raid cities of refuge to which ex-slaves had fled in an effort to escape their captors or masters. 5. Inaccurately representing the Kingdom of Dahomey as at a kind of historical crossroads during which its leaders were trying to discover a way to extricate themselves from the slave trade because they had decided it was immoral. This falsifies the historical record since this was not happening at the time at which the movie was set, nor did it ever happen at all in Dahomey's history. 6. Inaccurately representing the Kingdom of Dahomey as, in Gates' words, quote, the saviors of Africa, end quote. This falsifies the historical record, firstly because neither Gezo nor the people of Dahomey themselves had any sense of such a pan-African perspective, which is very modern, nor were they even remotely attempting to be the saviors of Africa. Secondly, because Dahomey's leaders were literally enslaving their neighbours in order to increase their power and wealth. 7. Inaccurately representing European powers as evil slave traders who are forcing Dahomey and other African nations to engage in slavery, while King Gezo and his advisers are trying to find a way to get Dahomey out of it. This falsifies the historical record since at this time it was overwhelmingly the European powers which were attempting to end the slave trade and it was overwhelmingly African kingdoms which were trying to preserve it. Finally, and to my mind arguably the worst sin of all, completely failing to give the slaves captured by Dahomey any kind of voice or even acknowledge their suffering at the hands of the Minon and the kingdom of Dahomey. The slaves of Dahomey in the movie are uniformly characterised as evil people who deserve to be enslaved and given no agency at all. The movie does not acknowledge their suffering, not even with a single title card, nor is it even acknowledged by the movie, director, production crew or actors. This is extraordinary in an era during which movies, production cast and crew often go out of their way to acknowledge historical wrongs, dispossessed people, stolen land and cultural erasure. Notably, people like Gates never engaged the descendants of people whose ancestors were enslaved by Dahomey and their objections to the movie. If all that's too much to process, here's an easier way to think about it. I object to The Woman King performing exactly the same offensive historical revisionism found in other movies I consider equally objectionable. Does Gates understand why the historical revisionism of the 2003 movie Gods and Generals is offensive since it glorifies the southern states of the US, downplays slavery and implies the Confederacy were the heroes of the Civil War? Well, I find the historical revisionism of The Woman King offensive for exactly the same reasons.